How's everyone today? Yeah, good, good, good. Well, thanks for being here, and uh, it's an honor to be able to kind of uh, stand before you and speak. What I would love to do today is kind of just share with you experiences that I have had through my career and some very unique uh, things that I've experienced in this, uh, in this time. You know, it's interesting because uh, I think most of us have pretty big families, right? So I remember back in the day, like I was like 16, 17, I went to spend the, the summer with um, my cousins in California. And I'm born and raised here in Florida. I'm used to pretty mellow beaches, life is good. I go out to California and we decide to go bodyboarding. And uh, I've never done this before, but we're going out there in the Pacific Ocean, seven foot waves, eight foot waves, 10 foot waves, and we're going out there, we're bodyboarding, we're having a good time, the water's freezing, life is good. And all of a sudden, I get, exp I get hit with this massive wave. It just comes crushing down on top of me. And I end up going underwater. Face gets plowed into the dirt or into the, into the, to the base of the sea. And I come back up, and I'm trying to catch my breath. And I'm with my cousins. And they're obviously used to swimming in the Pacific Ocean. They're all gone because they saw the, the wave coming. They, they bolted. And now I'm the little skinny guy from, from Florida. is out there by myself. Another wave comes and pow, hits me again. I'm down back on the ground. I can't breathe. Another one gets me. And this time, it was probably the strongest rip current I had ever felt. I had never experienced anything like this. And I remember wave after wave after wave, face getting planted in the ground, seashells cutting me, all this happening. I remember telling myself or thinking to myself, I literally am going to die. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm literally going to drown, and there is no one that can hear me right now. And my innate response was sheer panic and terror. But the only thing that I could think of at that moment, and I kid you not, was God, you are the only one that can hear me right now. Please get me out of this. Please. A second later, all of a sudden, I hear this loud rumbling noise. And I was like, what in God? God's here, second coming. The angels came to pick me up. I'm exhausted. And finally, I turn around. Baywatch came to pick me up. You guys know Baywatch? So the only thing I'm thinking, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Baywatch guy. You know, whatever. And then, I'm, you know, finally I realized that the guy is, like, actually taking me onto the boat. Finally, I get within reaching distance of the boat, and I'm like, get off me, man, I got this. <laughs> but I realized that this moment actually reminded me of something. And it, it actually it stuck with me because any time that I felt in my life that I was either nervous or scared or a combination of the two, God was always there to hear my prayers. And he was always there to listen to the issues that I had and to listen to me when I had trouble that I wanted to talk to him about. And I remember later in life, I ended up going to medical school, UF, and going to doing residency in Birmingham, Alabama, in general surgery. And I ended up matching here in a fellowship at, uh, in Orlando uh, in colorectal surgery. And I was actually hired to stay on as faculty at the fellowship that trained me to be the advanced minimally invasive surgical attending. And it was, it was interesting because you would think that after seven years of intense, rigorous, just bone-crushing uh, training, that the day I start practice, I'd be ready to go, right? You would think and you would hope, right? So of course, I'm the brand new attending. I have five fellows that are watching me ready to do surgery, and I get my first consult. This consult was for me. It was for a guy with an ascending colon cancer, a right colon cancer, and he's looking to me to be the expert to take his right colon out without killing him. And let me tell you, man, you would think, again, after seven years, I got this? Yeah, no. Let me tell you, I was, not that, I was just not quite there yet. And it was funny because although I knew I had phenomenal training, I mean, I got great training in medical school, great training in residency, ex excellent training in fellowship. And by the numbers, you looked at it, I had done about 
2,000 abdominal operations by this point in my career. So by sheer numbers, I was the man. And I knew this. I knew I had it. I knew I should be able to do this. I knew that I had great training. I knew I had excellent research. I knew I had won awards in clinical excellence. I remembered that I matched at a phenomenal fellowship. I remembered what I had to give and to offer my patients. But this feeling on this day with this patient was very different. My first patient was very different than any other one that I took care of because finally, my name was on his wristband. My name was attached to this patient as being his doctor, being his surgeon, which was very different from anything I had ever experienced before. And I had never experienced this feeling that I had in training. But I remember experiencing this same feeling when I almost drowned about 10 to 15 years previous to that. That feeling that I had looking into the eyes of my first patient about to take him to the operating room was the same thing of sheer terror and just being afraid. And I was not equipped for this. Most surgeons won't tell you about this. We won't tell you about the emotion that goes behind being a surgeon. And I honestly, I wasn't sure how to deal with this because never in my career was I trained to deal with this. And I just thought to myself, God, what in the world am I going to do? This guy is looking at me as the expert. He looks dead at me. I'll never forget. I'm looking at this guy in the pre-op holding area just before I wheel him back to the operating room. He's smiling, ready to go. He's a little nervous, but I'm terrified. He's looking at me like I'm the expert. I'm looking at him like I'm going to kill him. He's looking at me like, you got this, doc. I'm like, I got this, man. I don't know what I'm going to do. So I did the only thing I knew I could do. The thing that I reverted to when I almost died a few years ago. And I offered to pray with the patient. And I said, would you mind if I said a prayer with you? He said, no, no, no problems at all. And I remember looking down, I closed my eyes and took his hand. And I said, God, I want you to stand with me today in this operating room. I remember praying that God takes my hand and he uses it as his instrument to do this surgery on this patient perfectly. I asked that God would give me wisdom, would give the nurses wisdom, would give the anesthesiologists wisdom, would give all of us on the nursing and anesthesia teams wisdom to execute this operation perfectly. I remember concluding the prayer asking that God grant us all salvation. And I felt like I was so comforted by this prayer. I felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulder that I was just so excited to finally open my eyes, to look in my patient's eyes and say, you know what, man, you're going to be okay, even though this is my first operation. <laughs> I opened my eyes, and this guy is sound asleep. He could I guess it was a good prayer or I just gave him a sermon and he just clocked out. But, you know, it's funny because in medicine, we're all taught to keep medicine and, and our relationship with patients very black and white. You got one patient, you got one doctor. You got one diagnosis, you got one plan. You got one this, you get one that. You got an EMR, you got to fill in the blanks. You got a nursing intake, you got to have the physician intake. There's nothing else. Period. You don't put opinions. You don't put anecdotes. Nothing else goes into this equation between you and your patient except something that is black and white, something that is evidence-based. That's it. That's nothing else. And the world that we live in reinforces this. The world reinforces that we should never show emotion to our patients. The world and the, the, world and the culture of medicine reinforces that we should in fact build a wall between us and the patient so that we never develop that personal connection with our patients. And that we should never, ever bring up religion with a patient. And this experience with me praying with my first patient has never left me. 
This experience, when I pray to thy patient as me, as a Christian, as a deacon in the church, but most importantly as this patient surgeon, has never left me. And I feel like it did more for me than it did for my patient when I prayed for him. And I feel that God is reminding me that the theme of this convention is much bigger than the four walls of this room. That the theme of this convention where we do not conform to what society wants us as medical professionals to do, that isn't the case. That isn't the case for all patients. And I feel like God is reminding us about this with this discussion. <music> Studies have proven over and over again when you look at it about the benefits of prayer. Now, I knew I had a benefit personally. Mark Solomon had a nice benefit with this prayer that I offered my patient. But actually, studies show the exact same benefit for the very patients we care for. Actually, in fact, there's about 1,500 peer-reviewed articles, if you go to PubMed, that talk about prayer and medicine. And one of the meta-analyses actually says, quote-unquote, people who are more religious and pray more have better mental and physical health. That's what one of the meta-analyses says. Actually, when you look at Hummer and colleagues out of 2010, this was actually a very nice study that they did. What they basically looked at, church goers that were regular that went to church in california greater than one time per week versus those that did not go to church and they actually showed a 1.87 percent or 1.87 times increase in mortality for those patients that don't go to church versus those that do this actually equates to about a seven year reduction in a patient's life expectancy this has a measurable p-value is statistically significant. Other studies have actually shown the same thing. Bird et al. in 1999, it's a great study, actually published in a reputable archives of internal medicine. This study, check this out. What these guys did was they took 990 patients, consecutive patients, removing bias, and they randomized the 990 to two groups, 445 in each group. They randomized one to the non-prayer group, and they randomized the other one to the prayer group. And actually, it wasn't just prayer group. It was a remotely prayed group. So there was not like a chaplain or a priest actually literally physically praying for the patient. It was somebody far removed remotely from the patient, had their name, and interceded on their behalf. Actually, as you see from here, this author developed... 26 quality indicators like CHF, pneumonia, death, UTI, secretary cubitus ulcers, and all these other uh, conditions. And what they found in this study was that in the group that they had intercessory prayers, these guys had a statistically measurable decrease in measures such as CHF, pneumonia, cardiac arrest. They also had less need for antibiotics, diuretic therapy, intubation, and they even had a quicker hospital stay. These patients were blinded to the fact that they had intercessory prayer, but yet they got it and they had a clinical benefit from it. Another study, actually in cancer patients, was, which is what I do a ton of work in, was Carvalho et al. in 2014. It's a recent study. It was a relatively small sample size, but what they did was they actually took patients that were in a chemotherapy infusion center, looked at 20 of them and said, what was their pre-chemo administration heart rate, pulse, and anxiety level? What was it at the beginning of chemo? Then they prayed for them, and then they measured it right after prayer. And they actually found that in all metrics, anxiety, blood pressure, and respiratory rate, prayer greatly reduced their levels of anxiety, heart rate, and in their respiratory rate. Now you could argue that all of this is just because it's a nice, happy support group. Atheists could say the exact same thing, but that's just um, a sample bias. It's investigator bias. It doesn't really count. But the truth is, like I said, in that other study that was published in the critical care unit, these patients were intubated. They had no idea they were getting prayed for. And in fact, one other study, I didn't put it up here, I don't know how you guys would feel about it, but I'll tell you anyway. Looked at 
Islamic intercessory prayer in healing of diseases. And it actually showed no improvement of, <laughs> of their disease process. Just putting it out there. And we see this because in Scripture, St. James tells us, pray for one another that you may be healed that you may be healed. So it's no surprise that the data is the data. It's no surprise that I feel better when I pray. It's no surprise that now, to this day, when I offer prayer to my patients universally, that when I do it, they feel so tremendously better. Now, I started this for very selfish reasons, but accidentally had multiple clinical benefits. The comfort that envelops this experience of praying with your patient is something that can't even be described. It's only something that can be experienced. And when you think about it, when two or three gather in my name, I will be amongst them, right? What does that mean? Who is amongst us? Who is with us when we pray for our patients? Christ, the healer of healers, the Holy Spirit, the comforter of comforters. He is with us. He is dwelling between me and my patient. He is the one that's granting me comfort. He is the one granting my patient comfort. He is the one that's giving me the knowledge and the wisdom and the elegance to execute this operation successfully. Not me, but Him. From a practical standpoint, we have a very difficult life to live as healthcare professionals. It's a very difficult life because when a patient comes to me as a surgeon, they're going to Google me, they're going to look me up, they're going to read my reviews, they're going to read my readmission rate, they're going to do everything they can to ensure they're coming to the best physician possible to ensure that they have a zero complication rate. They want to put everything in my hands to ensure that I give them a flawless operation. That when they come see you, you dispense them the flawless medication. That you give them flawless therapy, flawless execution of their, of their diabetic uh, medications, or whatever the case may be. Prayer with a patient brings us all to the same level. It humbles the physician. It humbles the practitioner in front of the patient, in, in the side of the patient, to remind them that you and I are equal. I am nothing different. I might have a lot more training. I might know what I'm doing when it comes to this procedure, but my God, you and I were created in the image and the likeness of God. We are equals. We are brethren. Prayer brings me down to their level. It removes that so-called God complex that some surgeons might develop or that a physician might develop. It reminds the patients that I'm not here because of my doing. I am here by God's grace because He lets me do what I do. I don't know if you guys remember, there's this movie way back in the day, The Wizard of Oz, right? Remember Wizard of Oz, the whole movie, they're worried about this big, bad, scary, ugly Wizard of Oz, right? And it turns out they pull the curtain, it's this little short, chubby, chunky guy, right? But he had, what did he have? He had a big, a big machine, he had a big, big, big loud light, big lights, big flashy bulbs, all this. He, just like me, just like my patient, we're just human. We're not gods. We can't do anything other than the gifts that we've been given. When you remove my lab coat, when you remove my diplomas, when you remove the robot that I use to do surgery, when you remove all the fancy instruments that I do for, for taking care of my patients, I'm just another human being. And that is, in fact, what prayer does. And I think back to my experience when I almost drowned. And I think back to my experience when I first operated on my patient and offered in prayer, and I realized that the thing that gave me comfort was the thing that thus inflamed the Holy Spirit within me and in Him. It's the thing that allowed me to speak in the presence of my patient 
with our Creator, making us equal, to remind us who we are, why we're here, and what we're doing all this for. This is something that I was not taught in school. This is something I'm sure none of you guys were taught in school. And this is something, unfortunately, that is discouraged on a societal level when we pray for our patients. And this is something that's proven over and over in the medical literature actually to have clinical improvement in our patients' outcomes. It's something that requires us to arise above the expectations of society, not conforming to what they want us to do, but rather do what it is that actually is in the best interest of our patients so that we ultimately can elegantly and responsibly extend the healing ministry of Christ to our patients. This healing prayer is something that we're all equipped with. It's not something that you have to be a deacon to have, that you have to be the, the hospital chaplain to have, that you have to be a buna to have. No, man. This is something that we, every single one of us, just have to have an interaction with our patient. We must be bold enough to do this, but that's what it takes. It takes us having boldness in front of societies that we ultimately can represent our patients in front of God to, so He can intercede on our behalf to do good for our patients because we ultimately want to do good for them. I thank you guys for your time and also for the privilege of this podium. And glory be to God forever. Amen.